find that America would endorse the killing of unborn children and promote it and fund it throughout the world. Under the new administration, the month of June was proclaimed Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgender Month, Pride Month. Americans were to celebrate homosexuality and take pride in it. At the bottom of that presidential declaration declaring this month Gay Pride Month, it was sealed with the words, in the year of our Lord. And then the ban on open homosexuality in the military was overturned. That there was classes taught on it. The Secretary of State made a declaration that the United States would now have a new foreign policy. It would endorse what is called what gay rights all over the world, pressuring countries ultimately that are opposed to it to accept it. Laws have been passed that could declare the preaching of the Word of God illegal if enforced. And other laws were in the works that could force Christian ministries to hire those who clearly go against God in their life. It is not just the federal government where these changes have been taking place. When 9-11 took place, there was no state in the union where marrying a man to a man was legal. Now there are several. Interesting, it began from New England, the home of the Puritans. The Harbinger came out exactly with the year. It came that first week of 2012, even the first days. And that year, interestingly, turned out to be a year of tipping points. This past year was significant. A tipping point is defined as the moment of critical mass, when things begin to change rapidly, when change accelerates. This past year, with the Harbinger released, it was a year of tipping points. I don't believe it was an accident. For the first time, the numbers of Americans against the biblical definition of marriage for the first time passed 50% when just a few years ago a clear majority were against that. It was only about one-third. Now it's past the tipping point of the majority. For the first time a president came out for the ending of the biblical definition of marriage. It is estimated of the newer generation, ages 30 and below, 70 percent are for the ending of the biblical definition of marriage. About 50 percent of that age group are having children out of wedlock. That, wedlock that's the future. F over 50% of children born to the future generation. This is a generation bombarded by the media and now in school with propaganda that is overwhelmingly against the Bible. So every year by itself it grows. Just as the older generation dies out and the newer generation replaces them, that, that alone not even counting the barrage. In this time period, through the internet, pornography has blanketed the nation. To the point where it's said that at least once a month, two out of every three American men are watching pornography. And as immorality comes out of the closet, the pressure grows for believers to go into the closet. Recently, the president of a major fast food chain, a Christian, was the subject of media attacks and a boycott for doing what? For simply saying that he was for traditional marriage. That's it. But it's come to the point of brazenness that even that becomes the rationale for persecution. What looks first as tolerance, only to get up and get, get established, once it's established, becomes intolerance. Those who have had no real moral grounding or no spiritual grounding switch their positions on this without having any real reason why, except that everybody's doing it. When just a few days ago, a petition was sent by a number of Republicans and technically conservatives, who, many of which who came out formally for the definition, the biblical definition of marriage, now urging the Supreme Court in favor of gay marriage. And of course the White House, led by a man who just a short while ago relatively said he was wrestling with the issue, and how as a Christian he couldn't support it. Suddenly he switched his position. The same month that polls indicated that over 50% of Americans had just passed that point for it. Now it is the White House is vehemently, actively campaigning against the biblical definition of marriage, sending a message to the Supreme Court to overturn the biblical definition of marriage in sweeping terms. As the issue now hangs in the Supreme Court, those who stand for what has always been are opposed and attacked. In this year, 2012, in the recent Democratic Convention, the word God was removed from the platform, as was the word Jerusalem. 
When this came out and caused a backlash, they attempted to quickly put it back in. Yet the motion to put God and Jerusalem back in was clearly booed by a large percentage of the convention. And this is the convention that won the popular vote. And then came the election with several tipping points. For the first time, a president in favor, was in favor of ending the biblical definition of marriage was elected to the presidency. For the first time, three states, not one, three of them ended the biblical definition of marriage by popular vote. And the margins were along the lines of 48% to 52%, 49% against 51%. That's tipping point. And more and more talk of the end of the influence of evangelical Christians on America's future. And then came the inauguration and the sealing of this tipping point. And the, interesting, when you, when you, for those who have read The Harbinger, Isaiah 9:10, Israel in defiance of God is saying, we, we, we have faith not in God, we have faith in ourselves. We have faith in our own works, we have faith in our own future. The theme of, the official theme of the inauguration was faith in America's future, not in God. During which, for the first time, the President of the United States enlisted the entire nation into the gay agenda. Speaking of Stonewall, a violent riot in a gay bar with violence against police officers as part of the proud course we are all now to follow. The president said this, we are following a star that has guided us through Stonewall. What star? Interesting, there's a scripture that speaks of one who is called a star who is not good but evil. The inauguration was noted for the removal of the words under God where it should have appeared. And for the first time, in, in effect, a Christian pastor was banned, in effect, from praying in the public square because two decades earlier he said what the Bible has always said, that homosexuality is a sin. For that he was banned, in effect. In this year, 2012, it came out that for the first time in America, Protestants are no longer the majority of Americans. It is largely in the Protestant realm that you will find born-again evangelical believers, so it's, it's statistically significant. The same poll found the number of people who say they have no religion has, or no faith has multiplied. And with those under 30, one out of every three right now will say they are not a Christian. That's the next generation of America. And other polls put it more like four out of ten. We're not even talking about nominal. We're saying nothing to do with Christianity. This is the future. The age of what could be called Christian America is rapidly ending. Where the profane is treated as holy, it means the holy will be treated as profane. And that's exactly what has happened. Years ago, you would never see God or Jesus being used as part of a joke or comedy on television. Now you see both God, Jesus mocked in cartoons and skits. You see now that's no accident, it's all part of the same spiritual movement which is to war against the ways of God and the foundation upon which this nation has stood. The move to a post-Christian America or an anti-Christian America. Meanwhile, abortion continues unabated. Millions of unborn children are continually killed in their mother's womb. And for the first time, the government has begun seeking to force Christian businesses to pay for abortions. And even the realm of foreign relations, America's relation with Israel, even that is at its most strained and negative state since the rebirth of the Jewish nation. In short, America has continued its moral descent and defiance against the ways of God. Now we know there's no clear, outright reference to America in end time prophecy, which means it must lose its place as the head of nations. And we are watching now as other nations, one in particular, is set to surpass the United States as the head of the global economy. The national debt has not decreased, but increased in the last few years astronomically. And what that means, what it all means, is that the mystery of the harbingers in that progression of warning, of shaking and judgment, continues. So it's not only the message of the harbinger that's gone forth, but the progression of apostasy has continued, and so the harbingers themselves have continued. What was written in the book since it was released in January have continued to come true. And before we move forward to some things that have not been shared, for those who don't know what is the harbinger, I'm just gonna give you a quick, quick taste of it so you get an idea so we can move forward. The harbinger is the revealing of an ancient mystery that holds the secret of America's future. 
so precise. It contains the words of American leaders before they speak them, actions before they take them, even pinpoints exact days down to the hours of the greatest collapses in Wall Street history. The mystery of the harbinger begins over 2,700 2, years ago in the last days of a kingdom, ancient Israel, that had known God, turned away from God, and in the last days of that kingdom, before its judgment, there are manifested nine harbingers, prophetic signs, warnings of judgment. But the people of Israel disregarded the signs and continued on a path of defiance against God. A number of years ago, I will actually, a number of years, actually after the first, the first harbingers come, they are given a certain amount of time to either turn back to God or enter into judgment. They refuse to turn back, and in 722 BC, the kingdom of Israel is wiped off the face of the earth, the ancient northern kingdom. The stunning or the eerie thing or the scary thing is that, is that those same nine harbingers of judgment that appeared in Israel's last days are now reappearing on American soil. Some have appeared in New York City. Some have appeared in Washington, D.C. Some have appeared in the form of objects, others as events, as ceremonies. Some have involved the highest leaders of the land, even the President of the United States. It begins with a calamity falling on ancient Israel years before its destruction. An enemy is allowed to make an attack on the land. So it happened on September 11, 2001. The hedge of America's protection was lifted as it was with Israel years before the judgment. A warning, a wake-up call, a shaking. And that's where the harbingers begin. And it's linked to a vow that was made by ancient Israel. In the wake of the attack, instead of humbling themselves, they, they respond with a vow of defiance. It's recorded by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 9.10, key verse. They say, the bricks have fallen in the attack. But we will rebuild with hewn stone. The sycamores have been cut down in the attack, but we will plant cedars in their place. And from this come the nine harbingers. We don't have time now to even scratch the surface of the nine harbingers or the mysteries in the book, but I will just touch briefly, lightly on a few, very quickly. There is, for instance, the fifth harbinger, one that could be called the stone of judgment or the gazit stone. It'll appear year, three years after 9-11 on the pavement of Ground Zero, and around it will gather American leaders taking part in a ceremony and pronouncing vows of defiance over that stone. There is the sixth harbinger, harbinger the sign of the sycamore, a biblical sign of national judgment. The harbinger is manifested on the day of 9-11 on the corner of Ground Zero as a beam and a shockwave shoots forth from the towers and strikes, and strikes down the sycamore. There is the prophecy. In the last days of ancient Israel, the leaders actually vow this vow that pronounces judgment on their land. On the morning after 9-11, an American leader, as the Congress gathers on Capitol Hill to speak a, a response to 9-11, American leader stands in front of all the members of Congress and from the floor of Congress issues a proclamation. And out of his mouth goes forth the ancient vow of judgment on Capitol Hill spoken by the leaders of ancient Israel that led to their nation's destruction. Without knowing what he's doing, he utters the vow that brought destruction on ancient Israel. He pronounces judgment on America. He literally speaks of the harbingers without realizing they're actually manifesting. He sets the nation's course and where it will go. He, in effect, prophesies that America will reenact the course of ancient Israel and continue to go against God. And so from 9-11, America does not grow closer to God, but farther from God. And the mystery says that if the nation rejects the first warning, the first shaking, there will come a second shaking. And then comes the second shaking, a shaking not of buildings, but of American power itself. The collapse of the American economy. In the year 2008, which in the harbinger opens up another stream of mysteries, the Isaiah 9-10 effect, one called the mystery of Buttonwood or the mystery of the three witnesses. We don't have time to even touch on these, except I'll briefly only mention one. A mystery that goes back 3,000 years to the sands of Sinai. The mystery called the Shemitah. One day given on the biblical calendar, appointed to wipe away the financial accounts of a nation. Credit and debt are to be wiped away in Israel. Elul 29 on the Hebrew calendar, Elul that month again. On this day, the financial realm is wiped clean. 
It was, came around once every seven years. The mystery is based on a cycle of seven years. It was to be a blessing, but as Israel moved away from God and drove God out of its national life, the day of Elul 29 turned from a blessing to a curse, a sign of judgment on a nation that had driven God out of its life, had put money ahead of God, a sign that strikes the financial realm. The first shaking took place in 2001. The second took place in 2008. That's a cycle of seven years. The second shaking took place in September 2008. That's, a, that's seven years to the month of 9-11. The second shaking took place the second week of September. That's seven years to the week of 9-11. America was commemorating the seventh anniversary of 9-11 when the second shaking was being set in motion on Wall Street. And then came the greatest crash in American history in September 2008. They rang the bell that morning on Wall Street, but it refused to ring. They took it as an omen. In September of 2008, that's when it happened. When did it take place, the greatest collapse of the financial realm in American history? It happened on the exact precise day appointed by the word of God to judge a nation's financial realm. On the exact day, a nation that has driven God out of its life on Elul 29. The day crowning the seven-year cycle, the day of sevens. And on that day, how much was wiped out of Wall Street? Seven percent. How many points? Seven, seven, seven. And what happens if you go from that moment, that day, because it's not only the day of the Shemitah, it's even to the hours. If you go back seven years, it comes back to the month of 9-11. You've got 9-11, but you have something else. You have the other greatest crash in American history that happened right then. Happened up to that day, it was the greatest crash at that time. And it happened on a different day in September. It's actually caused by 9-11. But when you strip away the Western calendar, go back to the biblical calendar, a revelation takes place. The other greatest crash in American history up to that day happened on the exact same biblical day of the Shemitah to wipe away financial accounts. The two greatest crashes up to each happened on the exact same biblical day. And they, the mysteries, the seven-year mystery in the Bible, they happened exactly seven biblical years apart to the day, to the hours. It's mind-boggling. Only God could do that. And then, and I'm just touching because I'm, I want to, I want to move to some things I've not shared. But one, there's the mystery then of the mystery ground, and that is that when the judgment, destruction came to the land, the shaking. It returns to the ground where the nation was dedicated to God, the nation's consecration ground. In the case of Israel, it's the Temple Mount. It brings us to America's first day as a fully formed nation when it is dedicated. Its first president, Washington, is sworn into office in the capital city. He issues a prophetic warning of what would happen if the nation ever turned away from God, which is coming true in this day. And after that, Washington and the first American government proceed on foot to the appointed place to pray and dedicate America's future to God on its first day. If we can find out where that happened, we've got a mystery. We have found America's consecration ground. Where is America's consecration ground? It was in the capital city. It was not Washington, D.C. It was New York City. Where in New York City, on a specific plot of earth, America was dedicated to God at what we now call Ground Zero. America was consecrated. The, act, the ancient mystery returns. It returns to the place of the nation's foundation. A message of God saying, return, return, return. And there's much more to say of these mysteries concerning which we have no time. Because I want to share some things unshared that I could not have shared when I was here last time because they had not happened or I had not seen it or known it. That have happened since the harbinger came out, either confirming or fulfilling, coming true. In ancient Israel, the Lord gave them warning and spoke through scriptures, through his word. Could the Lord have been given more signs to America, bearing witness that this is all real and that this is his word? This is the word for now, the warning. And through scripture, could the Lord have warned? There is a very famous Bible, and some of you have it where you can read the Word of God in one year. It's called the One Year Bible. There's something very interesting about this Bible because one, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, the scriptures and then there's a day, there are days appointed for it. What happens if you open up the Bible, the One Year Bible, and you can do it, and search for the scriptures of the harbinger? If you turned 
to find Isaiah 9:10, that scripture of the harbinger. So if you open up, you find it, and you look at the top of the page, you'll find a date. What date? The date is September 11th. On every one-year Bible, called One Year Bible, it joins together Isaiah 9:10 and September 11th. Take note. Because the scripture that speaks of an attack on the land, it gives September 11th as the date. The scripture that speaks on the attack on the land by, a, by Middle Eastern operatives, and specifically speaking of those who began terrorism, the Assyrian, it gives the date September 11th. Every one of the Bibles joins together the scriptures. It speaks of a nation, the scripture that once knew God, that is in radical apostasy from God, it speaks of the first warning strike, and it has September 11th. Each Bible, doesn't matter what. It speaks of the sycamore being struck down, happened on that date. It speaks of all these things. Each Bible speaks of the vow that was spoken and gives the date. It was all spoken about that date. The first one at the Congress, Tom Daschle, who said that vow. And then, then three years later, John Edwards says the same vow, talking about the same date again. Talk about Revelation. All across the land, millions of Americans would all open up their Bibles every year on September 11th to this very scripture. The bricks have fallen. Every year the Bibles would open. The one year Bible, whether it's a living Bible, inter new and international Bible, American Standard, King James, or New King James. Not just that, but the, get this, the one year Bible came out before 9-11. So here's a prophecy. Here is this every year. It came out in the 1980s, the first ones. So every year, millions of Americans were opening up to Isaiah 9:10 on September 11th every year. And then it would all come true on September 11th. And something else. In every one-year Bible, not only is it Isaiah 9:10, I didn't know about this at all when I wrote that. The reason why we found out is because, because when the Harbinger came out, people all across America then read the Harbinger and opened up their one-year Bibles, and we got flooded with emails. But it's not only Isaiah 9:10, because there's another scripture from the Old Testament that's put in there on that day that's also appointed for 9-11. And what's the scripture? It's from the Psalms. And it was appointed for 9-11 years before 9-11 happened. Let me read you some of what's in this scripture that's appointed 9-11. It says this, the Psalm. My thoughts trouble me. I'm, in dist I'm distraught. Now listen, this is at the sound of the enemy. For they bring down suffering upon me. My heart is in anguish within me, for the terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. This is all pointed 9-11. I see violence and strife in the city. Destructive, verse 9 and verse 11. Destructive forces are at work in the city. 9-11. This is all appointed in the same time. An interesting thing, because the word for violence there, in the city, the violence in Hebrew, is a certain word in Hebrew, but an interesting word because it also exists in Arabic, with two different meanings. In Hebrew it means violence, wrong, evil, damage, destruction. In Arabic it means zeal, fervor, fanaticism. What is it that's seen in the city linked to 9-11 in those Bibles with Isaiah 9-10? Destruction, damage in the city, and zeal and fanaticism. In Arabic, in fact, the word specifically has come to mean Islamic fanaticism. It's marked in that Bible. Let's go even deeper. What's the actual word that I'm talking about? In Hebrew, it means violence. In Arabic, it means fanaticism. The word in the Bible appointed for 9-11 is the word Hamas. The very name of Islamic terrorism, which was also linked to Al-Qaeda. And if you turn to the next day, like the aftermath 9-11, you turn to Isaiah 9-12, I mean you turn to September 12th. Interesting because it actually, there in there is a prophecy where God says, I'm going to judge Assyria, those who brought this attack, the terrorists. Back then, and they were terrorists. I'm going to judge them. I, I, I allow this to happen, but I will destroy them. I will, I, will, I will destroy their warriors. Interesting, almost a prophecy of that, that God still would judge them, even Osama bin Laden. This is all, and you can go home and you can open that up and you'll see it yourself. 
Now the vow of Isaiah 9 10, two objects are used to symbolize the nation's defiance of God. To come back stronger than before when the first attack happens. The bricks are fallen, but we will rebuild with hewn stone. That's one object, hewn stone. And then the sycamores have been cut down, but we will plant cedars in their place. Or in Hebrew, it doesn't say cedars. It says eres tree can be a cedar, can be a spruce. The hewn stone was manifested as the beginning of the building of the tower at ground zero. The rebuilding of America. And the eres tree, the seventh harbinger in the book, was actually planted in the soil of ground zero. According to the mystery, it has to be planted where the sycamore stood. They actually did that. And they planted it there, so there stands this eras tree. Those are the two harbingers that are speaking of the rebuilding and or the defiance and that, that still exist today, that are still forming in a sense. One is forming because it's living, and the other is forming because it's ascending the tower. The tree and the tower. I want to speak about that. What is the significance in the Bible of the tree? Trees in the Bible are symbols of life, fruitfulness, can be, can, can be symbols of people. In Daniel's dream, it's a symbol of the king. The righteous are called, they are called Sadiq Katamar. They are like a palm tree. John the Baptist called out, he said, Keep, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. We are told to bear fruit for God. Trees bear fruit. Trees are a symbol of people, but trees can also be symbols of nations and kingdoms in the Bible. The Bible, God speaks of Israel, as we see, as a tree. Speaks of other nations as trees. Even the church, we said, we saw was linked to the tree. Why? Because trees are living. Trees are, are growing. A genealogy is growing. So are these things. So are nations. Trees represent kingdoms and nations. But then nations and kingdoms can come under judgment. And so God gives pictures of judgment using the tree. The axe is laid to the root. Judgment of Israel. We have already seen this picture in the, cutting, in the cutting down of the sycamore. The psalm, there's a psalm that speaks of the first national judgment in the Bible of Egypt. It says the it talks about the striking down of the sycamore tree, one of the harbingers. So in the prophets, God says, that which I built up, I'll break down. That which I planted, I will root up. I will uproot. That itself is in the ancient vow. But there are other pictures in the Bible of national judgment where God speaks to a nation using the sign of a tree. And you'll see it in the following scriptures. Ezekiel 17, 8 says, it was planted in good soil, good things, but it's going to wither away in good soil. He goes on, you know, Messiah curses the fig tree, it withers away. The image of withering is one of the signs of destruction of a nation. Cut off from life, cut off from God. It's outward form, but it cannot bear fruit. It's declining. And that's one of the signs. And another sign in the Bible, it says that, it says in Ezekiel, it talks about, it says, they will, I will cut off the branches. The branches of the tree shall be cut off. Speaks of national dismemberment. The breaking off of branches. Another sign of judgment. And there, and, and there so you got withering. You've got branches being broken off. You have bearing no fruit. And then it says, I will cut, and then there's another thing where it talks about, I will cut down your Erez trees specifically. The Erez tree is a symbol of strength. The cedar, the, the strength, the firmness, it actually means firmness, but God says, I'm going to cut them down. That's a sign of a nation's strength being cut down in the Hebrew word. And it just so happens that two of the remaining harbingers, one of them is the Erez tree. It's used, it was used to, because it's supposed to be this, 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 this strong, powerful tree. And what was planted in ground zero, at the corner of ground zero, the seventh harbinger was an Erez tree. And it was planted where the sycamore was, happens to be that. And it was called, it had a ceremony around the tree, and they called it the tree of hope. It's supposed to be, because it's an evergreen, it's a fast growing evergreen tree. It's supposed to be the symbol representing we're coming back stronger. It's supposed to reach heights of 40, 60 feet. But something happened, and is happening to the tree of hope. Ezekiel 17 says, it was planted in good soil that it might bring forth branches and bear fruit. Thus says the Lord God, shall it prosper? It shall wither in all the leaves of her spring. Behold, it shall, pros it shall not prosper, it shall wither. What has happened to the tree of hope? What has happened to the seventh harbinger? The Eris tree at ground zero is now withering away. I, I could have shown you pictures, it's, it's, it's dramatic. Planted in soil where other trees had prosper, it is withering away. The people who own the plot 
cannot understand it. They've tried to save it. They're trying to save the tree. It's still withering away. When I was, I was there in September, I went with a member of Congress and went, some others, and we saw it. Everybody was shocked. The member of Congress fell to the ground to pray on the soil there. Shall it not other, utterly wither away sign of a nation under judgment that even on the, it's on the outside of one way, but inside it's withering away spiritually. And then you have the other sign, the cutting off of branches. His boughs, his bows shall be broken off. It goes on. They will be broken off. What has happened to the seventh harbinger, the Eris tree, the tree of hope? If you go there, you'll see its branches are cut off. Literally, because they're sick. And so they're being cut off, the sign of national dismemberment. The withering, I mean, again, I mean, another time I can show you the pictures, it's withering, it is dramatic. In fact, in fact, the fact there is a, it's actually being held up, the tree's being held up by a rope. And here is the symbol of it's going to rise higher and higher. The, the commentaries speak of this. It says that the commentary say the nation saying it's going to defy, it's going to exchange its feeble sycamores for strong cedars which cannot be cut down. Well, that's not what's happening here. A rope is, is doing that. And, and if you look all around that plot on the corner of ground zero, in the times of spring or other times, you'll see everything's green except for that tree. Everything is green. Well, and one other thing I'll tell you, everything is green around except that one thing, except you have the tree, and right now the tree's just withering. And with the tree of hope there, you have a line of like 10 bushes, 10 green bushes. And the five that are away from the tree are, are prospering. The five that are near the tree are withering away. Everything around, it's as if it's cursed. Even the weeds are as they are struggling to survive. What is the meaning of this in biblical? Here's the harbinger and a biblical symbol that they have even made into a symbol. They gathered around it. This is, a, this is where we're coming back. This is our hope. Our hope without God is not hope. And that, that's the problem. The withering of the tree represents not necessarily sudden destruction, but progressive destruction. Picture of a nation cut off from its God, from its life. So everything it does withers. A nation spiritually dying. Still having the outward form, but inside spiritually diseased and rotting. The biblical sign of the cutting off of trees is the removal of, of blessings and power and glory from that nation. And the destruction of the heiress tree, it goes exactly in line with Isaiah 9.10. That's what Isaiah 9.10 is saying. They're saying they're going to do this and Isaiah is recording, it's God's recording saying, no, no, it's not going to happen. Without me, it's going to fall. And since America, I mean actually since 11, America has been trying to come back stronger and stronger and yet there's always another thing to come. The tree is withering. What about the other object, the tower? These are the two harbingers that are still, in a sense, unfinished, changing. One, because it's alive or dying, and the other, because it's a tower going up. Epitome of we will rebuild with hewn stone. The actual tower was actually begun with the ceremony of the stone, and then they began this tower. And they symbol, the stone was a symbol in the Bible of defiance. And so here they, they, they gathered around that stone as they laid that cornerstone. And the, the Bible versions, the commentaries, they, say, they speak about this phrase called spirit of defiance, spirit of defiance. The nation is responding in the spirit of defiance. They use it over and over again. And when the governor of New York spoke his, his, his proclamation over the stone, he said, we lay this stone in the revolutionary spirit of defiance. They reenact it in the book, and then it becomes this tower. In the book, the tower is the fourth harbinger. I haven't spoken. It's the most dramatic, colossal of the harbingers. Now, it turns out there's an ancient translation of the Bible, the first that was made centuries before Messiah. It's quoted by the New Testament again and again, the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Hebrew Scriptures, done by rabbis. When the Septuagint translates the vow of Isaiah 9:10, it does so. It does something very strange and fascinating. The vow says, "The bricks are fallen." We will rebuild with hewn stone, okay. But what they did, when they translated it ancient times before Messiah came, they said, the bricks have fallen, come let us build for ourselves a tower. In other words, a tower will rise on the spot of the destruction. And that's exactly what's happening. 
And exactly, it speaks of the stone in Hebrew. It was done right there. That's how it, and then it speaks of the tower in Greek. It's happening now. The rebuilding of the tower, beginning with laying this down. The, the tower has been mired in controversy. It's taken over 10 years. It's still not finished. But since 9-11, the tallest building in New York City was the Empire State Building. In the book, The Harbinger, the revelation of the tower is told from the Empire State Building, the deck. And everyone has been waiting for the day that the tower would again become the, the highest building in the New York skyline after 9-11. But nobody could say exactly when it was going to happen because of construction delays, weather, and a st another story going up. But it happened, it happened this year, in the spring of the year, after the Harbinger came out, one story was added to the tower, it surpassed the Empire State Building. It became the tallest structure in New York. It was the center of news media. It happened in the month of April. And it becomes the focus, the, they turned again to Ground Zero. In the Harbinger, a date is given which holds the mystery of Ground Zero. The date is April 30th. The day that the tower broke the barrier to become the highest in New York was April 30th, the date in the Harbinger. Now in the book, the tower is symbolized by an image in a clay seal of an object, a ziggurat, the Tower of Babel. The book connects the building of the tower at ground zero linked to the Tower of Babel. Now, I don't know if I was consciously connecting this with a phrase or not, but when the rabbis took Isaiah 9, 10, and they put in, they said, come, let us build a tower, what, where did they get that from? They got it from the Tower of Babel. They got it from Genesis 11, and they saw the connection between the Tower of Babel Tower of Defiance and Isaiah 9:10, Tower of Defiance. So they took it, a nation, they, they put the words of Babel on Isaiah 9:10. So the only, so therefore you've got Babel, you got the beginning of, you got Babylon, which appears throughout the Bible, mystery Babylon, end times, man's pride, man attempting godhood. We're going to go up to the heavens. So the translators they saw the connection, they saw a spirit of pride, a pride there, man's defiance, and they put it together. The only places in the ancient translation of the Bible where you can find those words are Tower of Babel, Genesis 11, and Isaiah 9, 10, the harbinger scripture. So here they did. Which were, and so here they speak about the tower going up. Now there's the towers going up. Interesting, because when the original people spoke of the tower going up, they said this is what they wanted for that tower in ground zero. They planned that it would be the tallest building on the planet. It was to be the highest building in the world, spirit of Babel. In the meantime, another has gone up to surpass it, but that tower will still be the largest building in America. The tallest man-made structure ever in America, North America. Well, something happened after I wrote the book. I found out something. That was there in the ruins of Ground Zero. In the ruins of Ground Zero, there was a scripture. And I was put into contact with a man who was the, one of the official photographers who took a picture of it. And it was a Bible that had, been, that had been destroyed in Ground Zero. And on there, there was, just a, there, was, there was just a page that you could see. He took a picture of it. It was charred. And he was whisked away because it was dangerous. And he went home and he looked at his camera and he saw what he, what he recorded. And he started to break down and cry. Why? He went home, he saw the image. What scripture was embedded in the ruins of Ground Zero? The scripture was this. Come, let us build for ourselves a tower. The very scripture. Here where they would build the tower, that speaks of Babel, the tower, and which only occurs in two places in the ancient Bible, there, Genesis 11 and the Harbinger scripture, Isaiah 9:10, was there in the ruins of ground zero which actually speaks here of a rising tower where it would happen. When you read the commentaries of Isaiah, on Isaiah 9, 10, one of the words that comes up is defiance, the other is resilience. The nation saying, we're not going to be stopped, we're resilient. It says Israel would, be, would build a tower, it would show resilience. We're going to go into the sky, into the heavens, it's going to show we're not going to be humble, we're, we're resilient, we're resourceful. The towers rise to the heavens is to be a sign of the nation's claimed, proclaimed resilience. When Obama was inaugurated just recently, not only was the one born-again Bible-believing pastor, in effect, banned from the event, not only did the president list all America in his campaign against the biblical definition of marriage, but something else concerning the inauguration. I wondered, could there be anything uttered that day that would in any way touch on the harbingers? 
They banned the Bible-believing pastor, but they had other pastors who were for gay marriage, and they had an openly gay poet reading his poem. As Israel in Isaiah 9:10 celebrated the works of its own hands, we will rebuild instead of God. In his poem, he spoke of giving thanks. He said, thank the work of our hands. And as the final work of our hands that he was proclaiming, celebrating, he spoke of the harbinger. And he spoke of the word resilience. He said, thank the work of our hands. He said, the last floor on the Freedom Tower, jutting into a sky that yields to our resilience. With that in mind, read at Obama's inauguration, the last floor of the Freedom Tower, the Harbinger, the tower that jutting into the, into the heavens, that shows our resilience. Same word used in the commentaries about Isaiah 9, 10 and Israel rebuilding. With that in mind, let me show you another thing, one more thing. And because of this thing that happened after the Harbinger came out, people who read the Harbinger and saw this thing happen on video, when they saw this in the news, they were stunned. Well, my wife told me about it, and I didn't believe her, and I wrote the book. <laughs> and she reminds me of this all the time. <laughs> Listen to your wife. I said, sometimes. The Harbinger speaks of three witnesses. The Bible says judgment is established by two or three witnesses. So is it, there is, there are two or three witnesses. There are three witnesses, American leaders who all in some way proclaim the ancient vow. We spoke, we touched quickly on two of them. But the last witness is the President of the United States. In his very first major address before Congress, in the same place where Daschle gave the vow, he said it, and in Hebrew, you know, I mean, I mean it speaks of bricks and stones and sycamores and eras trees. But what is the meaning of it? If you had to put it into plain, modern American lingo, Isaiah 9, 10 would be summed up with two statements. One, we will rebuild, and two, we will come back stronger. That's what it's saying. And even the commentaries say that. We will rebuild, we will come back stronger. That's what it says. The commentaries said they vow this. And there, in the midst of the economic collapse, the president goes to Capitol Hill, the same place where the, where the vow was first spoken, same chamber, and there he makes the center of his speech the vow. He says, tonight I want every American to know this. And then he says, we will rebuild. And then he says, the United States will come back stronger than before. Well, weird, because you don't say we will rebuild about economics so much. You talk about it, that's fun with the destruction. We will rebuild, we will come back stronger. That is the same power. Now, he didn't know even, the, the first two knew they were saying scripture, because they were saying word for word. But they didn't know what the scripture meant. They had no idea what they were saying. The president didn't even know what he was saying here. I don't mean that as a... But in the harbinger... In the harbinger, actually it links the two together, 9-11 and the economic collapse, as we saw before. The president did it without realizing he was saying the same words. But it also reveals the pattern, that template, that American template version of the vow. Now just this summer, several months after the harbinger came out, something happened in the news that caused, again, those who read the book to pretty much gasp. The president went down to ground zero to see the fourth harbinger. The tower, the one unfinished harbinger, still rising up from ground zero. Come, let us build for ourselves a tower. And they present him with a beam from the tower. A very significant beam. It'll be the final beam, it'll be the highest beam, that which will crown the tower, the final of the nine harbingers. It will mark the highest elevation of the harbinger. The beam is significant because the tower is all about height. Stronger than before. That beam will crown the harbingers and will be the highest structure in America. And that's the beam. And remember, the poet at his inauguration spoke of the last floor. We will rebuild. We will rise higher. They ask him to do something. They sit him down. They say, Mr. President, they show him the beam and they give him a pen and they say, write words on the beam. He can write any words he chooses on that final beam of the final harbinger. He sits down, and of all the words he could write, what does he write? He writes the vow of judgment. We rebuild, we come back stronger. 
the highest beam in America, the final harbinger, will have the American version, Isaiah 9:10. We rebuild, we come back stronger. The very vows, although note a difference, in the original vow, it's spoken in the future tense. We will. But now the president wrote, we are doing it. The vow is being fulfilled with this. The day after 9-11, the ancient vow was proclaimed on Capitol Hill, and that led, it says we will build, that led, that's specifically talking ultimately about ground zero in America, but it's saying it's going gonna, it's gonna to speak ultimately about that tower. And now that same tower is going to be crowned with that same words. The Hebrew, beginning with this, will end that way. We are rebuilding. We rebuild. Now in Hebrew, get deeper, the vow that sealed Israel's destruction, Isaiah 9, 10, the bricks are fallen, we will rebuild with hewn stone, the sycamores have been cut down, we will plant cedars. That's about 25 words in English. But in ancient Hebrew, this is the vow that brought destruction on their nation. It's this. The bricks, Levanim, or Levanayim, have fallen, Nafalu, but with hewn stone, Vigazit, we will rebuild, Nivneh, the sycamore, Shikmim, have been cut down, Goda'u, but with cedars, the Erazim, we will plant in their place, Nachalif. In Hebrew, how many words seal the destruction of the nation? Levanim is one, Nafalu is two, Gazit is three, Nivneh is four, Shikmim is five, Gadua is six, the Erazim is seven, and Nachalif is eight. In only eight words, they brought destruction to their nation. Well, the president, he inscribed on the vow, on the beam, was six words, but he added, he put two at the beginning. The full vow is we remember, we rebuild, we come back stronger. How many words in English? Eight words. The Hebrew vow that brought judgment, eight Hebrew words. The American vow, eight English words. Made by the American president. And when you put them next to each other, they actually match each other. The first two words in English and Hebrew speak of the destruction, 9-11. We remember or the bricks have fallen. The second two words, the American vow, is we, re we rebuild. The Hebrew is nevneh, which means we rebuild. The same exact. And the last one is, the last words are we come back stronger. And that, in the Hebrew, it says we're, basically we're coming back stronger. The vows match up. And even if you take the center word of the Hebrew, the, four, the middle of the eight words, the fourth word, you get nivneh, we rebuild. You take the center of the American vow, the fourth word is we rebuild. Or rebuild, actually. The tower of ground zero will be the highest structure on American soil. Reaching it, its highest points will have the words of defiance. So where do we stand? It's, it's continuing. It keeps going. If America continues on its course, this will continue and it will happen. The mystery continues to unfold and we are at a critical point. I have no doubt that the timing of all this, the word going forth, when was ordained by the Lord. America is at a real crossroads critical tipping point of concerning immorality, concerning the gospel, concerning the forces against the gospel and the establishment of ungodliness and the disestablishment of faith. Concerning America's place in world history, it's at a tipping point, no accident. And what I've shared is that the signs are continuing because the apostasy is continuing. What does that tell us? The hour is late. It means we have to take our time more seriously. And what we've ever thought of doing at some point, of getting things right, in our lives at some point cannot be done at some point it's got to be done now or not when Jeremiah lived in the wake of judgment he knew that living he was living in critical times man he was dealing with issues of sin and godliness his own had to be treated too you have to take these things more seriously regarding our life your walk your your salvation because the gospel is the issue of judgment and salvation and we cannot, we don't, that is critical. We cannot live as if it were not critical. Getting the word of salvation out is critical. We can't just come to prophecy conferences. We have to be part of prophecy. We have to proclaim the word of God. The signs of the time that we are seeing is a wake-up call. 
The, pre the priests of Israel could not bring others to get right with God until he first was right with God. He can't cleanse others until he's cleansed. He can't bring others to God until he's entered him. And the watchman cannot help to save the city unless he has taken up his post or she has taken up her post. His position on the wall and lives separate from the world or you cannot be a watchman. The mystery is real. The progression is real. The calling is real. And the time is late. If the night is growing darker, the lights better get brighter. God will bless the light. God will anoint the light. For you who go all out for God, he will give you favor. He will open up the doors. In the latter part of this year, let me tell you, before we, we bring it home, something new began to happen that started coming to us. We began to get more and more reports, first rumors, of a new phenomenon that the harbinger was now reaching Capitol Hill. We received reports from a famous member of Congress that is stirring, he said the stir, a stirring is happening on Capitol Hill among believers and it was linked to this book called The Harbinger. We received about 15 contacts concerning from members of Congress, senators and House of Representatives thanking, thanking, being thankful for receiving The Harbinger. I received a contact from a very famous, very, very, very famous member of Congress, like I'm not allowed to mention, but you know the person, who read The Harbinger, saw the DVD, the Isaiah 910 Judgment, and said, we have to do something about this for America. And they came down to meet us in New York City. And we prayed at all the sites of The Harbingers, this member of Congress. And then, then we prayed there and then we were taken on train to Capitol Hill to go into the chambers of Congress to pray over the nation. And then on the day of the president's inauguration, I mean, it's a strange thing that God's always had this parallel, what's happening in America, what's happening with this. You know, the, Lord, you know, the day that represented a real sealing of this tipping point, this inauguration, you know, the Lord is not finished. He always has a plan. He always makes a way. He opened up the door for me to give the keynote address at the presidential inaugural prayer breaks. How that happened, I don't know why, I don't know how, but I wasn't going to argue with it. I just knew it was the Lord. I said, Lord, how could you do this? Is like, this is you, right? I could not hold back. You know, it's interesting because the harbinger speaks of the mystery, that mystery ground that concerns a presidential inauguration, the first. And it speaks about the prayer gathering done on that day. So here's the prayer gathering on the presidential inauguration. And they say they want you to speak, and they want you to speak, they want you to give the keynote address. And I said, really? I said, how much time do I have? I said, well, how much do you need? I said, oh, wow. <laughs> I said, what do you want me to speak about? I said, the harbinger. I said, oh, boy, this is a setup. <laughs> I knew it was the Lord, and I knew I could not hold back, and I didn't hold back. And over a million people have now heard the speech. By God's grace, I mean, I didn't get any sleep that night. I, I was coughing. I was sick. I got, well, I'll say I got barely one hour sleep. I was so weak. I was so weak. I said, Lord, I am so weak. You just do it. You have to do it because I can't. And, I, and as I'm speaking, I was like outside my body saying, wow, God, you're doing it because it's not me. I would not do that. But the point is, if the night is growing darker, God will anoint the light to grow brighter. He, if you will go all out for him, that's the challenge. He will bless you. He will honor you. It's written, the eyes of the Lord search throughout the entire earth, looking for the one whose heart is completely his, that he might strongly lift that one up. You be that people. You be that person. If you will follow him with all your heart, then, you, and then be strong in God and be in good courage, because if you're with the light, you're on the winning side. You don't have to fear anything. God wins, and those who stand with him win always. Believers of God, this is not the time to shrink back. This is not the time to be intimidated. This is the time to be bolder in God and all out for God. For we have a different kind of a tower. This age is a tower that crumbles. We've got a strong tower that cannot be shaken. And we have a tree that cannot wither away, which is the cross of Messiah, which is our tree, our tree of hope that overcomes the world, period. And the name of the Lord is our strong tower. The righteous run into it and are saved. 
The name of the Lord is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is still the hope. He is the only hope. Outside, you know, there's nothing else. The time is critical, and we've got a calling, and we've got a message, and we've got a hope that is sure we are part of prophecy. We've got to take this mantle up and more seriously than before. In our own lives, we must take it up more seriously than before. Bring everything into the light, every part of the light the sins, the fears, the desires, the everything, every part, let it be touched by the light, cleansed by the light, and God will bless your life. And that you, that we truly become the light of the world, the light to the nations, the light to Israel, the light to America, that we were called to be. For the one who knows, who knows God will not fall, but will be strong. And the one whose heart is his will, he will do great and mighty things. The one the one who will become the one who who will become truly his in every way if we will do that you will be that one you will become you will become unshakable immovable unflappable you'll become unstoppable and will light up the world you be that one and let us light up the world with the power of the almighty god for the glory of his name yeshua jesus amen and amen praise the lord we praise you father